Thank you very much, Salim. Um, good to see you all here. I'm, as I, Salim promised, I'm going to try and throw out some challenges. For those who are watching online, please don't quote these things as if this is what I believe. I'm going to say some things which are intended to be provocations and questions. Um, one of the participants, Pablo, said last night at dinner that he felt that there is not enough controversy in the meeting, that we're playing it too safe, that we're not looking at things um, in a way which is challenging to our own thinking. We're com becoming complacent. So what I want to do is to throw out some things that are controversial to try and make us think a bit more. And I also think we're not thinking big enough. I'm going to give some suggestions as to why it's a problem that we're not thinking big enough and, and with great urgency. Um, I also think that we're not accepting enough that climate change is not a new thing which is separate from everything that has been going on before. I don't think there are enough link linkages between what we're doing for climate adaptation and the previous knowledge and experience we have in development work and, and in development studies. Now, the first challenge is to say that nobody is defining community. I've been to four of these conferences. There is very little reflection at all on what we mean by community. We say, oh, we're going to work with the most vulnerable communities or the most vulnerable people, and we don't really reflect on what that means, and I think we really do. And people are not reflecting on what we mean by community-based. So I think we need to really uh, be opening that up for discussion uh, much more fundamentally. We therefore need to think about why are we working at the community level? What is the reason for which we think the community, so-called community, is where we should be working? And we need to justify that much more. Well, the idea of working at community level goes back 40 years in development work, not in, community, in uh, climate adaptation, but 40 years of work in which there has been a challenge to top-down policies relating to development. And the idea that top-down related to trickle-down theory is not working for poor people in developing countries. And from this emerged the challenge of doing work in a participatory way, which is what community-based adaptation almost always implies, that it is intended to be participatory. Now, I'm going to suggest that we don't have enough top-down policies. So the scaling up issue that is the theme of this work here, I'm going to challenge that and suggest that actually we should be doing much more in relation to top-down policies. Because the problem is now that community is worshipped. We there is no problem now which NGOs or some donors will discuss which cannot be solved by putting community-based in front of it. So we have community-based natural resource management, community-based health um, and first aid. We have community-based um, this, this, that and the other. So, so long as we put community-based in front of the problem we plan to address, we think we're doing it right because it gives the justification that we claim it's participatory. So I kind of joke about this and say that actually we've invented saint community which can perform miracles. And I want to challenge this idea that we cannot assume that what we mean by community is valid in achieving what we claim we want to achieve for adaptation. Um, I'm sorry for the PowerPoint in the sense that I know everyone gets fed up with PowerPoints, but in a bad acoustic where people are in different languages and we have video um, watching us, it's a way of, uh, of um, enabling people to see what I'm saying, I hope, a bit more un um, easily. So the first question is, do we actually understand what we mean by community? Um, and what do we mean when we say community-based? So I think we have to really go back to basics on this and think about what might possibly be wrong with community-based adaptation or inadequate about it, and do we need to be thinking beyond it? So these are my kind of initial controversies. Is community a, a sufficient as a basis for achieving adaptation? And I'm going to suggest that it is not. And what do we need to be doing as well as, and sometimes instead of, community-based uh, adaptation? So what do we need to do instead of or as well as? And are we thinking big enough? Where does community-based adaptation fit into the much wider scheme of uh, international politics, national politics, and so on? So starting then with the problem of community. What is a community? I asked some of the participants in a short course we were do doing here to write down their definition of community. 
At, understandably, out of the 40 people, there were 40 different definitions. There was quite a lot of overlap amongst them. Many of them said it's about culture, it's about identity. Many of them said it's about place and location. Out of these different definitions, I would think that most people in this room would assume that community means a location, and that location is where you perform your adaptation at the community level. We need to think about that. What does it involve? Does everyone belong to a community? Is it a place? Is it a location? And let's unpack that and think about it. And in what way is community-based different from just thinking about individuals or households? How would we pin that down to say, right, we are doing this at the community level, and that is different, qualitatively different, from dealing with individuals or households? For example, can a community make collective decisions? Usually not. They are internally divided. We have to understand these internal divisions. Why are communities relevant for doing community-based adaptation? Um, we have to justify why they are relevant. And they also involve power relations. Power relations including land tenure. And we shouldn't be afraid to talk about things like power and land tenure, access to and control over resources. We have to restore a willingness to talk about class, economic and social class, and the power that is connected with it. I have not found any research or NGO action going on in South Asia that looks at land tenure as a significant factor which may make it difficult for people to adapt. And yet we're sitting in a region, including Bangladesh, where estimates vary between 40 and possibly as much as 60% of the population have no ownership or tiny ownership of land. How do we expect landless people to adapt? I don't have a clear answer to that, but we should at least be thinking about it. In every village that you go to in Bangladesh or India, Nepal, Pakistan, a significant proportion of the people are landless. Nobody is researching what it means for them to adapt. We have to be looking at issues like land tenure and the power relations that go with them. And we need to be thinking about not just poverty reduction, but wealth reduction and sharing. We need to be thinking, and I'll come back to this at the end of my slides. And I would hazard a phrase and say there is no such thing as community. We've invented it as a convenience for our work. How do we define it? Difficult. It has internal divisions. Agnes has just been speaking about gender issues. In every single place that we call a community, it is divided on gender lines. Those gender divisions relate to how much work is done, whether people of different genders get more or less food. And we think it's a community. Now, we all claim that we want to mainstream gender issues into it, but I think that is actually quite difficult and tough because culturally, many communities with these gender differences do not have the same idea about how gender should be, gender relations should be changed as we might have, and that's a challenge. There are internal divisions which we are not acknowledging enough, including the land tenure one. They're divided on gender, class, ethnicity, caste, religion, age group. Are we doing enough to actually acknowledge that, or are we pretending that they can all work together and make collective decisions? My early uh, research work, which was in India many years ago, I visited a friend's village. He was from Tamil Nadu. We went to the village. He showed me around. I had a very interesting time, a swim in the ocean. And as we were about to leave to go back to the town where he lived, he said, oh, the head man of the village has seen us. I will have to introduce you to him. And so I go over and meet this man, and he shows me his house, offers me tea, and so on, the usual hospitality. And as we're leaving, I'm shaking hands with the head of the village who does speak no English, and my friend speaks very, very good English, and he's translating, but also giving me a commentary in my ear as I shake hands. He says, by the way, do you want to know why he's the head of the village? He owns more land than anybody else. Last year, his wage laborers, the workers in his fields, protested about the low wages he was paying, and he had the two leaders killed. So I shake hands, smile more, and get out of there as quickly as possible because I'm shaking hands with a murderer. If we went from outside as an NGO, we would call that a community. How do we deal with that? So we've got these power relationships which are vitally important to understand in these divisions. Communities are not warm and cuddly. 
They respond to us in a way which is different because when we go there, there's resources available. There is possibilities of doing things. When we use the concept of community, it is we who find it convenient. We use it because it fits our idea of fairness and working at the grassroots, the, grass, the participatory approach that's emerged over the last 40 years. Community fits with what we want to do and what funders think is good for delivering to the poorest or the most vulnerable. We need to think about the distortions and problems that emerge out of our comfort with using the idea of community. In other words, community equals where we are working. And I think that is the most significant definition that we could use. Doing CBA, community-based adaptation, is also immoral and therefore wrong. Now, that's a powerful statement. Of course, I don't exactly believe it in this, in this uh, bold way. Why am I saying this? The reason is, by definition, community-based adaptation implemented through NGOs using donor money, uh, whatever, can by definition only reach a percentage of the people. And in most countries, it would be a minority of the people. We cannot do adaptation for climate change unless it is for everybody. So I'm throwing out the challenge, how, as people who morally are interested in adaptation, do we create systems alongside CBA which enable adaptation to happen for everybody? Because if we are comfortable working in the community-based area, we are immoral in the sense that we are not thinking about how it works for everyone. Every single person and household needs to adapt. So what do we do about what, what happens to the rest? Our solution for this is normally what is called advocacy. But the question is, does it work? Because for adv advocacy to work and for our community-based activities to be scaled up, somebody has to care. The government has to care, for example, that actually the evidence we provide is useful and worthwhile. So what are we left with in actually thinking about what is community-based adaptation and what is its role? I would say that it enables experiments and the emergence of new adaptation measures. That is perfectly valid and very good to be doing. And we need to provide the basis for that and the evidence that comes from it. It gives us ed evidence, an evidence base for how adaptation can and should be done. Although, and, and where and how adaptation funding should be used, for example. It enables us to link potentially with government, local government in especially, as agency, as we heard from a Bangladeshi colleague here just now. But we also need to be wary as does evidence actually work. If we do evidence-based advocacy, we have to realize that many people who receive evidence for creating evidence-based policy are not interested in evidence. They're interested in ideology. They will go against the evidence if the evidence disproves what they believe without, without, uh, on the basis of their ideology. We cannot assume that evidence will produce the result we think is justified. We also think that CBA can develop adaptation measures that are self-starting. Uh, self if an NGO is only doing adaptation measures in a community which require the NGO to be there to give money or to do things with funds, then we're not going to achieve it. Every single village where there is not an NGO has to have the opportunity for adaptation measures which can do be done without an NGO and without any money. They have to be self-starting and profitable on their own basis. So what I'm saying is that we need to be using CBA to support the design of top-down policies that enable adaptation for every single person and every single household. And we have to be thinking about CBA in that context. So what else should happen to enable adaptation for everybody? How do we make sure that CBA activities, some or all of them, are profitable and can spread quickly to other places? I think in the RCAB project that is operating, getting going in Bangladesh, some of these issues have been designed into it. So that may be a, a supportive model, which we've talked about to some extent in this conference, which other people might want to look at. It is about how you scale them up quickly and spread them quickly. Here is one key thing that I think we need to think about, and that is livelihood diversification, especially for rural activities which reduce climate dependency. In most poor developing countries, a very, very high proportion of the population is almost 100% climate dependent. Whatever we do to adapt agriculture leaves them still climate dependent. 
we may be able to tweak some things with saline tolerant rice, heat tolerant wheat, blah, blah, blah. We may be able to do something about that. But I think we have to shift a significant proportion of people out of being climate dependent by developing alternative um, livelihoods. And I think that's also good for poverty reduction and development generally. And to do this, we need top-down policies that will help adaptation for everyone. For example, we should explore the extension of social protection measures into what is called adaptive social protection. For example, that could include training measures for additional livelihoods, education for diversification, cash transfers, um, vouchers for training, for health, for education. And I think we need to be understanding, we need to think much bigger. We need to be understanding and discussing and linking climate change adaptation at the community level with the much bigger sphere of um, changes that need to take place in the world. We need to support massive reduction in the number of people who are climate dependent. We need to shift funds um, for non-agricultural livelihoods, but rural-based, which mean we also need to be thinking about supporting strategic retreat through supported migration from areas which cannot be, um, 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 cannot be maintained over time. We need to think about investment in a very old geography concept, growth poles or small town growth centers, which support the movement away from dependence on climate and agriculture into non-agricultural rural livelihoods in small, based on small town growth. And we need to understand and learn what has happened over the last 50 years, especially in Taiwan, South Korea, parts of India and China, where we have had this transition to rural industrialization and rural livelihoods which are not farm-based. We need to bring that knowledge into it and understand it for how you get people out of being climate dependent. Now, I'm not proposing that those models are beautiful models. They, are they have been, in many cases, environmentally disastrous, but we have the knowledge to deal with the environmental risks. What I'm saying is we need to think big about very rapid transitions. The South Korea, Taiwan, underwent a transition from a situation in which a vast majority of their people were farming and agriculture and therefore climate dependent to where there is a minority who are dependent on climate and agriculture. But th those transitions took 30 years. China's transition has taken less time in many ways. We need to be thinking big about how do we achieve this urgent transition to a less climate dependent world in order to deal with the emergency of climate change and change the way the world works. Two, two last slides, Salim. I'm sorry, I know you're worried about my timekeeping. Rob Vanderberg of the Jeff gave a talk a few weeks ago at IDS uh, in Sussex, and he said, he gave these startling figures. He said the current funding available um, uh, for adaptation projects is of the annual uh, figure of around 10 billion. The lowest or the, the median estimate of what is needed for adaptation, Stern, Oxfam and so on, is that we need 100 billion per year to enable adaptation to take place. He then throws into this mix what's going in the contrary dire direction. He, has picked out an estimate that public subsidies, excluding the private sector, is giving away to fossil fuel industries and resource intensive, fossil fuel intensive agriculture, a thousand billion a year. And that is doing the exact opposite of producing um, a reduction of greenhouse emissions. In other words, public money from governments around the world gives 10, million, 10 billion to adapt and then gives a thousand million to damage the world even more. Now, if somebody in the Jeff is worried to the extent that he gives those kind of figures, we should be worried that we are not talking seriously enough about the other issues which are creating the problem and us piddling around with a few billion dollars to try and fix the problem. And we've got to think about that. Some other shocking figures. The top 200 energy companies Last year alone spent that figure, $674 billion, exploring for new oil, gas, and coal. We've got 10 billion to do adaptation. That is shocking. The estimate for wealth kept in secret tax havens amounts, by one estimate, to $21 trillion. 
these tax havens like the British Virgin Islands, the clue is in the name, when the British government comes to Bangladesh or any of your countries and says, we need to deal with the corruption in your country, you tell them to get lost and go and fix the corruption in Britain. Okay, because Britain has an institutionalized set of corruption which manages these tax havens uh, in different parts of the world. The cost of the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, and the so-called war on terror, annual spending in 2006, this is an estimate from the US Congress um, Budget Committee, $80,000 billion in, in that one year. What are we doing? We are really tiny, tiny insects trying to push an elephant. Let's get real about this and at least acknowledge that we're facing these problems. And here we are trying to do community-based adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. I